Hey, weirdos, I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. And this is officially a big series of Morbid. It's a multi-parter. And it's like a celebration of our fucking five podcast in years, guy. I'm holding my hand up to signify five. Should we high five, Freddie? Hi. Oh, Whoa. that was a good one. That was a really oh, good oh, one. Eyelash of my I eye. bet. Oh, we knocked the eyelash out of Ash's oh my eyes. God, quite literally. <laughs> Ow. Fuck. Oh, man. Okay. Death, destruction. You know when they're like not yours, so then they this stab is it. you It's further. five years we're blinding Ash right now. God, I've been going <laughs> through it on this podcast lately. <laughs> Oh, guys, um, every episode last week, I was like, yeah, my stomach hurts. I got the stomach bug. <laughs> That's what it was. She was she was gearing up to that stomach bug. The last episode that we did, uh, I got the stomach bug that night. Yeah. So. Yeah. So because everybody was like, huh, Ash hasn't been doing great the last <laughs> couple episodes. Every episode, I was like, I don't know. My stomach is just really <laughs> off. It's really off. It was it off was. for like a week. And then I was like, you know what I should do? I should eat chicken and waffles. Yeah. And then the stomach bug said, oh, you, you thought. stupid bitch. <laughs> That's what it said. Yeah. I heard it all the way from here. Yep. But yeah, I, somehow she got the stomach bug and she kept it to herself. So I appreciate that. That's because you weren't anywhere near me. Yeah, thank goodness. Love you so much. I love you so much. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to be alone. Alone. <laughs> Leave me alone with my neurovirus. Hopefully, you know, we're getting out of that season, I hope. So let's let's all just stop giving each other the stomach bug and shit. Yeah, be careful. GI bugs are really... Uh, they're really having a moment right now. Yeah, ask Beach Gem on TikTok. Beach Gem on TikTok. She'll tell you all about it. Oh, and you know what I learned from Beach Gem? I think it was Beach Gem that said it. And you've said it before, too. But I think you said it last time. You were sick. You can't use hand sanitizer oh, to get rid of kill. the neurovirus. And nope. do you know why? Because it's wrapped in a lipid, mm. which is a fat. Look at that. Which is a fat. fat. Lipids. Science. Science. With morbid and beach gym. Yes, you have to <laughs> wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Yeah, so use soap and water. That'll get rid of the GI buggies. But other than that, they're sticking around because... Oof. Oof. Yeah. They're but hard no, to get gone. No, you said hopefully they're leaving. I hope so. Let's all knock on wood together. April showers bring no stomach bugs. Except that's how that goes. So it's, it's called writing. It. Look it up. It's called manifestation. Okay. Duh. Uh, so yeah, this like we said, this is five years, guys. Woo! And I know you looked at the title of this episode, so this isn't going to be a big, exciting surprise <laughs> right this second. But, like, oh. I hope you're excited because you hit play. Uh, you have been asking, all of you. A long time. For five years. <laughs> all of it. For H.H. Holmes. Yeah. I have been wanting to do H.H. Holmes for five years. It's true. But I knew it was a big, long one, similar to Jack the Ripper. I knew that it needed, like, real attention paid to it. Like, because it's just got so much extra zhuzh to it that I was like, this is like, you know, it's got history. It's got all this mayhem to it. You got to siphon through all the lies and find the actual facts in the case because this motherfucker lied. Like a liar. Like a liar. He lied right to everyone's face holes all the time. I like how you're doing a lot with your hands I right am. now. And the way that you were just like digging through the lies. Just, I'm digging. It made me think of the little girl and knocked up and she's like, and then you dig and you dig <laughs> and then the baby's inside. <laughs> That's exactly it. You dig and you dig and you dig and you find a little of the truth yeah <laughs> that's what this is it's a little truth baby but yeah he was a liar and i think we're gonna get right into it i don't know how many parts this is gonna be many so just strap in i think it's at least gonna be three buckle up brothers. could be four i'll let you know probably in the next episode for sure how many epi how many parts it will be but you know strap in this is our big five-year series that we wanted to give to hh H. holmes because he's a piece of shit and you know the story is wild yeah so Let's start at the beginning. That's a good place to go. It always is. In the late 1800s, Herman Webster Mudgett. Her Herman Webster Mudgett? Take that in. 
H.H. H. Holmes's real name is Herman Webster Mudgett. So he could have been H.M. Mudgett. Yeah. Wow. H.W. Mudgett. Yeah, Webster. Yeah. That was a little, that was a little <laughs> dyslexia like, close, for you. Okay. <laughs> we'll just flip it upside down. It's I was cool. kind of just thinking about the Real Housewives of New York when Luann says like the Herman Munster shoes. There you go. Yeah. Of course you are. Yeah. But this is where we need to begin because it's like, all right. So H.H. H. Holmes Made objectively up. is a is a cool name. Like H.H. Yeah. H. Holmes flows. It's a very like smooth name. You would probably trust an H.H. H. Holmes if you didn't know this H.H. H. Holmes. Yeah, you like know? all this aside, it, like every, all of it, 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 of would, course. it would be a stage name. It would. Like H.H. H. Holmes sounds cool. Yeah. Herman Webster Mudgett Not doesn't as cool. sound as scary. No. Or maybe sounds scarier, actually. I should say. It yeah. sounds scarier. It just sounds kind of lame. But, you know, Holmes, we're going we're gonna to refer to him as Holmes because that's what he went by for most of his name. That's what people knew him by. That's what his crimes are really under. Um, we'll call him Herman for part of this, like in the beginning, but That's you'll fun. know who we're talking about. Um, but <laughs> AKA H.H. H. Holmes, he claimed and confessed to officially killing up to 28 people. Some people, most people, all people believe that it could mm -hmm. be well over 200 people that he has killed. You believe? I believe he's way up there. Yeah. I think he's more than 28. Okay. Um, while the full extent of his crimes and the number of lives that he did take is probably something that we may never know to the nth degree you know like we're i don't think we're going to be able to find every single person i would love to believe we could um it was really his ability to kill without conscience or hesitation really for financial gain most yeah. of the times sometimes he did it because he just liked to do it but most of the time it was for financial gain do you think it was like financial gain and he's, he liked it? Oh, like it was for sure a mix. Yeah. It was for sure a mix. And I think it was also the systematic way that he got rid of his victims in his murder castle, which don't worry, we will get to. It feels like a horror novel. It doesn't feel like real life. Yeah. When you read the actual facts of this, you're like, that's not real. But it is. It's wild. And in truth... He wasn't really like a genius. He wasn't as calculating as he's really made out to be. He was just a man who learned pretty early on in life that being a confident liar can get you a long way in the world, unfortunately. Sad but true. Especially if you can create enough chaos and confusion to make it absolutely impossible to actually tell the difference between fact, fact and fiction. You ever seen The Great Gatsby? There you go. If you can spin a tale so wild that people can't tell if it's real, fake, what is, what isn't, there's nuggets of truth here, there, and everywhere, he can he got a long way with it. Yeah. And when we go through this, you're going to see, damn, he went a long way with it. I'm actually really like excited to hear your telling of this because I don't know that much about H.H. H. Holmes, to be honest. He's, they, it's weird that like, I think a lot of people, a lot of people know the name H.H. H. Holmes. Yeah. They know the murder castle. You know, if they know like the the things about it that we've all been told. But when you dig into it and you realize like he was not just a monster, he was such a piece of shit. Mm. Like he was like he was a piece of shit in every aspect of his life. Good. It was like he was just such a shit bag. It's wild. Fantastic. And he was such a fucking liar. Such a liar. He had no qualms about hurting everybody along the way in various ways. Like emotionally, financially, physically, anything. You he think like didn't care. he didn't care? Full blown soci sociopath. I think he is full blown. Yeah, full blown. And all he gave a shit about was money. Yeah, that's all he cared about, and it didn't do him well in the end. I feel like it, you, if your main goal is just money, it's never gonna work out no, that well. It's if not you look be at great. like money obsessed people throughout history, they usually are like. Yeah, it doesn't work out in the very end. For in them. the very end, it, it might doesn't. End, it might work out along the way, but in the end, it doesn't. It can't be your only goal. No. It ultimately, it, be, it ends up eating you alive. Yep. It really does. Now, let's start at the very beginning of H.H. H. Holmes. Yes, so H.H. Yes. H. H. Holmes, like I said, was born Herman Webster Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Ah, bitch. On May 16th, 1861. His parents were Levi Mudgett and Theodate price i think that makes him a taurus oh there you go wow i didn't see that for him i'm gonna double check though uh but according to h.h H. holmes himself 
His early years in New Hampshire were, quote, no different from those of any other country bred boy. And I was well trained by loving and religious parents. Eh, I don't know about that. His parents were Methodists. They were very strict disciplinarians. His father, Levi, was a house painter and would later go on to serve as the town's postmaster. And his mother stayed at home. She was a housemaker. Okay. Now, they were not known to be like strange, mean, to have any like dark ways about them by neighbors or anything like that. According to Adam Seltzer's book, H.H. Holmes, this true story of the white city devil, uh, neighbors remembered the Mudgets as, quote, very upright, God-fearing citizens living in a quiet, secluded section of the country with no trace or taint of immorality or vice in the family history for at least three generations. I love that they were like, now, we can't tell you about that fourth generation. They could be <laughs> heathens of the highest order. But for three generations, these people did the damn thing and they seemed okay. Okay. Like, we, we can vouch for three generations. We're not going back to that fourth. I don't know. But it's weird because you get little, again, with that. there's a lot of parts of this story where you hear Holmes himself tell 40 different things like versions of the story or you hear other places just give you different things you will find if you read about them that they were you know there was nothing of note in okay. his childhood with his parents that seemed to set off anything but him saying like you know they were good people i didn't really have anything wrong with them that is probably true remember it was the 1800s so i'm pretty sure they were strict disciplinarians meant they beat the shit out of their kids when they got in trouble and that was just normal back then right. so i think it was one of those things that it was like oh yeah like any just, whatever and normal like all throughout his life really That's so what would so he it's have just said? like whatever but herman himself i'm gonna call him herman for now I wrote like an that. autobiography from prison later called holmes's own story and he wrote it in 1895 and he starts the book like this R this, this will tell you everything you need to know about what kind of theater kid this guy is uh -oh. quote come with me if you will no. to a tiny quiet new england village nestling among the picturesquely rugged hills of new hampshire this little hamlet has for a century been known as gilmanton here in the year 1861 i herman w mudgett the author of these pages was born narcissist like wow okay girl calm down <laughs> <laughs> like like I, twas I, the author of these pages, was born. It's fantastic. It's like, and the world was a worse place for it. So <laughs> thank you for bringing us back to that moment where we all went, fuck. I also love that he starts the book with, come with me, if you will. Everybody else is like, no. Nope. Yeah, we're like, no, no. It, I know, it reminds me of like the, in like Willy Wonka when he's like, come with uh, me and you'll see. No. Like that, and it feels the same. And like yeah, exactly. like when Willy Wonka did it, I was like, no, no thank you. And no. now when he does it, I'm like, no, no. thank you. <laughs> I don't. Anytime someone says, come with me, Stranger. say, no, thank Danger. you. I'm going to go this way. So like we said, the Mudgets were a well-liked family. Holmes' childhood seems fairly unremarkable for the time period, especially. <laughs> His mother remembered him as, quote, a good little child, very pretty and loving. As most moms remember their children being. Yeah, that's like, very sweet. pretty and loving. But not everyone remembered him as being so pretty or so loving as he began to get older. Mm. According to Ira Pennock, a cobbler in Gilmanton, he said, quote, Herman was a hard worker, but still there were some things about him I didn't like. He was too fond of money. Mm. And Pennock told reporters that there were a lot of times when he was around the shop that he would see money go missing when he had been around. Or when Herman would claim that he'd sent payment for a service, he would just pocket the money himself. That's fake as fuck. And in fact... Of the many stories that people got after he was arrested, finally, which we will get to in the ultimate episode of the end, um, a lot of people said that he was generally polite and pretty, like, fine. Like, no one was like, wow, he was so popular or cool or, oh, he was so weird and odd and, like, we hated him. Yeah. It was just like, oh, he was fine, I guess, like, whatever. But they always mentioned him possessing a very unhealthy preoccupation or obsession with money okay. that was always the thing people were like yeah he was fine he was polite i guess like he wasn't super offensive but like my god that guy was obsessed with money mm. and it's like when everyone in your life that is the one 
like like common thread that everybody can touch upon that's bad yeah it, you you want to be known for like a little bit more than a that. little bit more than scrooge mcducking your way through life i think is i like a really that. good way of doing it was that an adverb <laughs> yeah no, sure. no, no that no, would verb. be ly that was a verb it was a verb i like it <laughs> i like it i like that you scrooge mcduck does yeah a verb. you know but by most accounts he did struggle a little to develop healthy interpersonal skills as a child which to me would be a red flag now considering his adult activities. But at the time, you know. Also the 1800s. So like, yeah. was there even people to make friends with? Was anyone having healthy interpersonal <laughs> skills at that point? I don't think so. But according to one of his neighbors, as a boy, he was, quote, a boy easily influenced and did not appear to be well grounded in firm principles, notwithstanding his excellent home training and instruction. So he just couldn't stand in his own convictions. Mm. And honestly didn't seem to hold any real moral strongholds of his own. And that's not good. That's a red flag to me. But other neighbors remembered him spending a lot of time by himself, kind of being a little bit of a loner sometimes. Um, another neighbor named Betsy, Betsy oh, Hoadley. Fucking love the name Betsy. You know, I thought you were going to be like, oh, I know Betsy. Oh my God, that's my <laughs> good girl, Betsy. Betsy. <laughs> Betsy Hoadley. She said, I don't know if you heard that pup bark, um, but she said, quote, he always seemed to be by himself. I know that instead of playing with the other boys, he would wander off alone or on long walks. He was never much of a favorite with the other boys. He seemed to be very secretive. He was too arrogant and domineering to be popular with the children. Again, that alone to me isn't a huge issue, but added into everything else later. And it's definitely another red flag that you're like, uh. And what was he doing off by himself? That's the thing. And being secretive, it's like, uh. You killing animals? And also of note, many who knew him as a boy later said that he would never make eye contact when addressing children or adults. Huh. Would not look you in the eye. He wouldn't look anyone in the eye. To me, I was like, oh, that's, that's a little sketchy. But then if you read a little further into this, you see that a couple of medical professionals did diagnose him at one point with stravidmus. Which that? is technically like um, cross-eyed. Oh, okay. Now, this can make it nearly impossible to maintain eye contact physically. And people, you know, it can actually like hold people back because people think, look at it as being like, oh, you're sketchy or untrustworthy. But really, I just can't look at you. But it's really you. like he honestly just couldn't look people in the eye. Oh, that's So sad. like that isn't super fair to like label as like, oh, <laughs> that's a little, like, here's the thing. I'm sure he was on, like, he was objectively untrustworthy and objectively a criminal. So like, even if he could look you in the eye, I'm sure he wouldn't, but like, right. physically he couldn't. <laughs> so like, well, we won't use that as yeah, like, we, oh, we will, red flag. We'll rest on that. Now, although he did like to invent things when he was younger and he showed interest in a few areas, he never showed a real direction and he seemed to kind of float around without a real purpose for a while. Same. And it was really a bit later that he finally settled on medicine as his thing. Now, the stories recounted to reporters after he was arrested um, are definitely influenced by what he did and what he was charged with and what he was Gotta found sell to papers. have done. So it is like a little biased when you look at it later and people are seeing hindsight in full 2020 now, remember? Now, these things are never super red flags until they add up and you sprinkle in some murder and then you're like, oh, yeah, that all makes sense. Exactly. Nevertheless, people definitely all kind of came to a consensus that he was odd he was very apathetic he was fucking obsessed with money and honestly when you put that on with today's understanding of psych the psychology of con artists or killers it's pretty on par lines up yeah those line up so mm -hmm. it's not like everybody's just making shit up this is who he was now one interesting story that's often told was that when he was a young boy he always had like a fear of the local doctor's office which is pretty common in kids, and especially I'm sure in the 1800s, the local doctor's office was a scary fucking nightmare den. So they like, just have all their like yeah. huge ass tools laying out. <laughs> like I, I'm not gonna fault little little Herman for that one. He's like, I bumped my knee. They're like, we're gonna cut it off. Yeah, it's like ah. Uh, mm. And this guy, um, his name was Doctor Nahum White, I believe his last name was or his full name was, and he was a known. Um, like he was very into dissection. He was an anatomist. He was very good at his job. He was very respected, but he took dissection to another level sometimes. Okay. So he had things in his office that would have been a little morbid. TM. Oh, And shit. also like a little scary yeah. for a child. 
So that makes sense. But one day, a couple of older boys dragged Herman forcibly into one of the rooms in the office and showed him a skeleton. Where are, where are all the employees? Yeah, I mean, 1800s. They're like, I don't give a fuck. Go Damn. Ahead. I love like, that they're just that like, kid. yeah, we're going to run in here real quick. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't tell him. to run in. This skeleton, by all accounts, was set up so that it had its arms outstretched, which Herman said made it look like it was about to grab him. Yeah. And it was like this like big, uh, like open mouth skeleton, like scary. Oh my God. And so it scared the shit out of him, like totally traumatized him. But at the same time, it fascinated him. Okay. And he said that was the beginning of his fascination with medicine and anatomy. Okay. I'm sure it scared the shit out of him. I don't know if that was the beginning of his real like fascination with medicine i think he's trying to use that as like here's this origin tale of my of my great career in medicine which was bullshit anyways so it's like i don't know about that well because a lot of times you're inspired by like multiple things yeah exactly i was like no i think that you knew that doctors made more money and so you wanted to do that yeah <laughs> i think that's more you do love a pretty coin yeah i think it's more that my friend but during his teen years he graduated high school at 16 and he started working a number of odd jobs, and finally he ended up teaching at a local school for a little while. It was during this time where he was teaching that he fell in love with Clara Lovering. Clara was a girl from a prominent family in, le- in nearby Loudoun, New Hampshire. And now, interestingly, people who knew Herman early in life said that he had been obsessed with getting married very early hmm. in life. Um, even when he was like 14 years old, he was trying to get that dowry. He was trying to get that dowry. There you go. And in fact, after his grandfather passed away, his grandfather left him a small parcel of land, which was very common. Um, and he took this as like, well, I'm a landowner now, so I need to get myself a wife. (laughs) (laughs) Slow down. So he, at 14, he proposed to this girl who was actually boarding with that cobbler, Ira Pennock. Who was like, he was a weird kid. Yeah. And probably stole money from me. And also Um, proposed to this lady that was living with me when he was 14. I guess this girl that he proposed to was like visiting the country from New York or something. Like was staying and boarding at Ira Penick's for the like some period of time. Sure. And so Ira Penick was like, yeah, you can't marry this girl. She's going back to New York and like I'm supposed to be taking care of her. And like you can't just like. I can't, like, marry her off to you, you psycho. Like, Like, what the hell? what's happening? So she had apparently either accepted it and it was like a no, you can't do that, or she didn't accept it. And the proposal. Returned to New York very shortly after. Um, But he was undaunted, though. (laughs) Don't worry about it. He wasn't going to, that wasn't the end of his romanticism. But um, he tried again when he met Clara Lovering. So Clara was very well-liked, very respected, People thought she was sweet and kind and really didn't have a bad thing to say about her. A neighbor once said about her, quote, she was a very pretty little woman when she was first married and was very devoted to her husband. She was a she was of a modest and retiring disposition. OK, I, that sounds great for 1800s. Like th- that's Victorian. Like you go, girl, I think. She was an she was an it girl. She, she went on hot girl, girl walks. There you go. They were like, I always see her in the morning on her hot girl walk. <laughs> yep. She's drinking her greens. That's right. She is. She's getting it. People said you couldn't help liking Clara. Oh, I love now, that. Apparently, the two of them began officially dating at a church social when Herman slash Holmes saw another boy hitting on her. Oh, no, you don't. And he basically threatened this boy's life if he didn't back off. And that worked, apparently. And they began dating. And, like, why did that work so well? I know. I'm why like, wasn't that boy on? like, you're not going to do shit, Herman. You can't yeah, even like, look me in the you. eye. But this guy was probably like, he probably will kill me. Because so. <laughs> a lot of people throughout his life were like, I think that guy's going to murder people. Well, exactly. Like, they just, like, thought it. Like, yeah. They, like, he didn't even need to do anything violent. He did later. But when even before he was, like, actively outwardly violent, it's like people were like, I don't know. I just feel like he's going to murder someone someday. Like, he just had that vibe. <laughs> it was and I'm foreshadowing. Like, I, I know you can't really do anything off of that vibe. Like, what are you supposed to do? Be like, I feel like you're going to murder someone, so you should get arrested. The you air, can't. It worries. It, it, the air does worry. <laughs> Go listen to the rewatcher. <laughs> it, that's a funny, it's a funny little tidbit from there. The air worries about him. And- it does worry about it. But it worked for Clara, this whole threatening the guy that was hitting on her thing. I mean... 
I mean, a guy that she was like, all right, back in the day to fight for my honor. Yeah. Two guys fighting over you. But you know what's sad? He's not going to. No, no, He's a piece of shit. Yeah, of course. Uh, But he proposed not long after they began courting. And the two eloped in Alton, New Hampshire in July of 1878. And they were both 17 years old. Now, on par with Herman's secrecy and general oddness, it was several months before his family or Clara's family even knew that they were married. Wow. Uh, when they found out, they because they just got married in front of like a justice of the peace. Yeah. When they found out, they were uh, not happy on either side. Apparently, Herman's mother, so H.H. H. Holmes' mother, said Clara couldn't have found much worse. Which feels like a stark turn from the sweet family neighbors, remember, and from Herman being like, yeah, my family is so kind and wonderful. I'm like, your mom didn't think this girl could find much worse than you. Oh, that's his mom that's saying That's his that. mom. Oh, shit. So that's what I mean when I say, like, imagine if you found out that your mom said that about yeah. you. And she was like, she, and I guess she said, like, oh, she's going to have to support you. Oh, Cause she, cause she knew she was like, he's a fucking deadbeat. Like She's I know like, this. He's pretty, but that's <laughs> he's about pretty it. <laughs> and he loves money, but he can't get it himself. So he's going to take yours. Yikes. It's like, damn, your own mom knew. That's rough. But then later, if you research a bit deeper into their family, it seems there was this weird, strange jealousy that his mother and his sister, Helen actually had Whenever he found a girl that he liked. I don't like that. There was something strange afoot there. I'm sure of it. I just don't know what. You know what, though? Like, some families are like that. Yeah. Like, especially if, if there's one boy. It's, yeah. He's always, like, the crown jewel of the family. And it gets weird sometimes where it's like, I'm going to kill any girl that comes near him and stuff. And it's like, yeah. Yeah? I, think I there's don't a, know. I think there's a TLC show about it. It's it's always been a weird vibe to me. Yeah. When like it, it's, it immediately makes me question when like a like that's why I love my mother-in-law. Like she was never, ever like that. No, mine neither. Like it's, a, it's in fact, she always is like, you know, thank you for making him so happy kind yeah. of thing. Like she's just always like so kind and like supportive of it. And she always has been. Yeah. It's always a little off putting to me when like mother-in-laws or future mother-in-laws are like, weird. I'll fucking kill you. And it's like, OK. All right. But you like I'll see TikToks where like people who don't like even have kids yet they're like someday my son I'll hate his girlfriend. Yeah, and it's and like, you're like are, why are you gearing up for that? Here's like, the <laughs> thing, like you can't. Yeah. Period. Like y- you, you can't. can't. Like and so, you know what I'm saying. Sit down. You can't. <laughs> so. You cannot. It's just a it's a weird vibe. It is. It like is. you should like my personal thought process with that and like we're not getting off on a tangent so don't worry. Or maybe we are. And it doesn't fucking yeah, matter. I was going to say I'm not going to go far. Don't worry. <clears throat> but my personal thought about that is that like I want to love the person and I think we've talked about this before that like I want to yeah. love the person my kids love of course whoever they are as long as they're a good person and they make them happy to let's me go. I'm like cool eventually I get more kids like mm-hmm. I get to be dude that's what my future you know? mother-in-law always says Drew's mom literally says she has that. six kids see and that's like it's like that you should want why wouldn't you want that yeah that's the ultimate goal exactly I will love to love the people my loved ones love right like you know like that's how it should be like you want to make sure they're like if they're a shit person obviously then, you gotta, no. then no but if like they've done nothing and you're just going into it being like I'm gonna fuck your world up like that's, that's a bad weird. way to go into any relationship yeah. and again you can't. You can't. So, <laughs> so, so Herman so, Munster's mom. You can't. Yeah. Oh Herman wait, not Munster. Munster. God damn it. <laughs> Herman I'm Webster. Stuck in a place of Roni. You are. So <laughs> her, Herman Webster's mom. You cannot. And sister, you can't either. Yeah. Because that's even weirder. That's, that, that takes it's all it, just yuckas. That takes it even to a weirder place. Yeah. Uh, but Clara's family was not too pleased either. But she was. They were not pleased that they weren't really established. He wasn't stably working. Like, they were like, ah, (laughs) you guys kind of jumped into this. And they were both 17. Yeah. I mean, which at the time, I guess it probably wasn't that weird in the 1800s. But like, they weren't, I think they were both just like, I would like you guys to have like a decent life. So we got to get you on track. Mm. So Clara's family took matters into their own hands and set Herman up with a job as a clerk at the grocery store, at a grocery store in East Concord. And it was a grocery store where Clara's family owned. Um, and Cla- a lot of Clara's family members worked there too. And they said if he, they went while working with him, they got to know him better. Yeah. That's probably why they did that. Yeah. And the, and it was smart because they said he, one thing about him was that if he even got the slightest compliment 
about anything, it would blow his head up wildly. Oh. Like a very much like a narcissistic kind of vibe uh-huh. to it. I'm not diagnosing him. Don't worry. But get out of your armchair. Get out. I'm out of my armchair. <laughs> but I'm just saying he that that's vibey with narcissism Absolutely. for sure. He was definitely is. like a narcissism adjacent is what I'm saying. Uh, but he loved to be complimented. OK. And would obsess over it. And it would just make him be like, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. oh, you did really great at stocking those shelves. And he'd be like, well, that's because I'm the greatest shelf stalker this side of the Mississippi. You fuckers like <laughs> bow down before me. Like you it was, fuckers. It was like too much. <laughs> like it was never like. Thank you. That's usually like, that's what you should it. just go with. But, you know, whatever. By all accounts at this time, the couple seemed fine. They seemed happy. In fact, people said he was seemingly in the beginning very smitten with Clara. Um, people said he would walk like miles to see her after work and then oh. walk miles back to work. I hate saying, oh. I know, because in the that, beginning it sweet. looks like there was intentions of possibly living a a life with a clean life. you know but i think the intention was probably fleeting to the point of being like maybe it will and it's gone yeah. like it was literally like ah, yeah. like couldn't even couldn't even blink without it like it was that quick uh because he never had any good intentions ever again so don't worry <laughs> good now a year and a half later the couple's son robert was born okay. in february 1880 um in, in his teens, he had been, like I said, very aimless, didn't really know what he was doing. But they said when when he got married and when he became a father, it did seem to awaken some kind of like, I got to get my shit together. Kind That's of thing. good. That's usually what it should do. He wanted to be somebody. He Great. was claiming. Um, and Holmes's position as a store clerk didn't really give him an opportunity to like rise up the ranks in his opinion, like enough. Mm-hmm. And he so... And it really was only meant to be a stepping stone because I think it was Clara's uncle who had owned the store. And he was like, I was just trying to give you this to get like a leg up. Yeah. You know, so like calm down. Save some money. (laughs) Don't don't worry. He's like, I didn't want you to take over the fucking business, asshole. Well, and his whole idea was like, hey, I was giving you this leg up. Maybe you learn this business and maybe you go open your own store somewhere. Yeah. Maybe maybe you get to know this whole business. You and then you're a store owner somewhere else. And right. We can, you know, everybody's happy. And even if not that, like, you tuck some money away. And you learned a little bit about business. business. You know, and working with people and finances and all this stuff. Yeah, just about being in the working world. Just being a human, you know. But he, Holmes quickly, Herman, I should say, Him at this point, he's Herman. But he quickly grew pretty tired of this work. He thought, quote, that he thought he was, quote, altogether too bright for the life of a country storekeeper. Okay. In um, an interview after he was arrested, Clara actually said to reporters, father tried to encourage him by telling him that someday he could have a store of his own and could make a very comfortable living. But he seemed to think he was too smart for such an ordinary occupation. He thought he could make a lot of money fast. He became imbued with the idea of becoming a doctor, and he used the talk of the immense fortunes that physicians had made in a short time, especially if they invented some patent medicine. He became obsessed with creating some kind of patent, patented medicine. I remember that part of yeah. the story. Now, despite his penchant for get-rich-quick sh- schemes, like he was that kind of guy. Yeah. Like you know those kind of people. Tommy now. Haverford. Exactly. He did seem at this time that he was becoming very serious about becoming a doctor. So, which wasn't money. a get-rich-quick scheme. He was going to have to go through a lot of training, obviously. And spend a lot of money. Exactly. So he did quit his job at the general store, and he started studying with Dr. Nahum, uh, Nahum Wright, who, or White, excuse me, who had owned that practice in Gilmanton, the one who owned that office and was a, um, an anatomist. That and was very respected, very renowned. Amputations, um, though, right? Loved amputations, loved a, like, very morbid dissection. Like, he was yeah. just... And he, again... He was a very good doctor by all accounts. He was very respected, held many esteemed positions, like not bad things to say about this doctor at all. He just at the time was seen as someone who took it to a different level. Okay. Now, maybe it wouldn't be. Okay. But back then it was. Um, But he started working with him. He was studying underneath him. And it's funny because he came full circle back to that office with the skeleton that scared the shit out of him. That is funny. That's um, pro- well, maybe that's why he said too, like, oh, it all started here. Yeah. And it's like, I wonder if his like extreme dissections and extreme like um, kind of uh, d- 
displays of anatomy in that office was something that Holmes suddenly found himself drawn to. Like sparked something within him. And when he wasn't working with Dr. White, he would spend a ton of time studying on his own time uh, medical books, any medical book he could get his hands on because he just wanted to start right away. And by 1881, he took a job teaching at the Potter District School in Gilmanton, which, remember, he had taught before. Um, And this was like a small class of like 15 students. So he didn't have a ton that he had to do for that job. So it allowed him a lot of time to study on the side. Okay. Meanwhile, Clara and Robert were living with her parents in Loudoun. She was essentially raising him as a single parent. Like he was kind of absent from that child's life. Um, or well, now, maybe that's a better thing. I was going to say maybe it was better for him, but the <clears throat> distance between her and Herman at the time was just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and in the spring of 1882, Holmes left Herman left Gilmanton for Burlington, Vermont, and he started studying medicine at the University of Vermont. So he was even further away. Mm. Now it should be noted that medical schools at the time were regarded pretty dubiously. Uh, If you listen to our Burke and Hare series, you remember talk of resurrection men, resurrectionists, or grave robbers. How could I forget? Med students themselves were basically known to grave rob for their anatomy lessons. It was almost one of those things where, like, you could show how committed you were by being like, I dug my own corpse for anatomy today. Fantastic. Corpses were not easy to come by legally at the time, and pre-doctors got a doctor. So they're going to do what they got to do at the time. (laughs) They got a doctor. Um... I found in one of the sources that we will list in the show notes, I found this epitaph of a nine-year-old girl named Ruth Sprague from 1846 who died in Hoosick Falls. This just kind of shows what people thought of physicians at the time. It reads, Her body dissected by fiendish men, her bones anatomized, her soul we trust has risen to God, where few physicians rise. Oh, shit. They said, physicians going to hell. I was like, I'm... I don't know if that's really fair, but like, you're like okay. they might save your kid at some yeah. point or and like I mean, you. At the time, that's the only way they had just discovered that you can't properly teach physicians without dissecting corpses. It's yeah. just the way it is. To this day, we do that because you have to. Right. In order to learn about the human body, you got to open the human body up. It's just the way it is. Hands on, baby. So there you go. And like, fortunately, now it's all legal and it's less all very, grotesque you know much more ethical much more all of that good stuff back then nothing was legal or ethical or anything of the or fucking even hygienic like it's like were things, they still throwing shit out the window at it, this point it was wily yeah. then like if you look up pictures i gotta find the picture and maybe we'll try to post it of like these you know early med students in the 1800s doing a dissection and we can like blur out the thing if you want but I mean, like they even are, put a note before. exactly just so you know it's really not gruesome to be honest no but all of them are in three-piece suits and just wearing like leather aprons over their three-piece suits the while doing hats. an autopsy essentially and it's like i can't imagine eviscerating in a three-piece suit i don't think you are meant to like that is a wild but how fucking dapper is that Oh, the, I was saying to you <laughs> like earlier wild. today, we were having this discussion, even just like the fact, like how women used to do their hair. I'm like, yeah, I want to do my hair like that. I'm about to start fucking sleeping with socks wrapped all up in this noggin. Yeah, to make it these soft curls. Yes. Yeah, I and love like it. the voluminous of Some it all. Some things back then, they, they had it right. I mean, would I say that you should eviscerate in a three-piece suit now? No. no. But it, we got cool pictures from back then, so that's hey. all that matters. <laughs> Cheers. But either way, again... They were they were looked at as a little little side eye back then med students. I just wanted to set the tone. So very few peers or college faculty really seem to have even remembered Herman much hmm. from this time period. But those that did said that he wasn't exactly their favorite person. Ooh, oh. it's, 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 they weren't, he wasn't terrible. He just he wasn't that great either. Okay. Um, a woman named uh, Mrs. Brew who Holmes actually boarded with for nearly his entire stay in Burlington because they med students would stay at boarding homes. Like people would t- keep them in there. It's like top um, chef. It, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it's exactly like that. Uh, she it's rem- like project you know, There you go. She remembered Herman saying that he was married because he was still married to Claire at this <laughs> Don't time. Don't you forget it. Technically. But he was, quote, always flirting with a number of young girls in Burlington. What a piece of poop. And he actually paid particular attention to Bruce's daughter, which she did not like. Oh, no. And they're living together? Yes. 
Mrs. Brew also said that um, Herman would wake up early every morning and leave the house for what he said were long walks for his health. Got to get those steps in. But yeah, it's like he put on his Apple watch and he was out there. Herman on a hot girl walk. Trying to close those rings. Trying to get to 10K, baby. (laughs) On a hot girl walk. But he also would have wine with an elderly widow every day. And at first you're like, wow, that's lovely. But then it's like, no, he was just trying to get her money. Yeah. Like he absolutely was. He was wooing her. Even Mrs. Brew was like, that bitch was trying to get her money. Yeah. Like 100%. You fake piece of shit. It's like in Gilmore Girls when Kirk befriends elderly residents of Stars Hollow so that he can be put in their will and get their diamonds. And then he sells one to Luke later to propose to Lorelai. You know, it's just like that. Isn't it wild that (laughs) Kirk did that? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I love Kirk. It makes sense. It does. It really does. I think he doesn't quite get the the bad of it all exactly you know now according to mrs brew um herman was fine generally pleasant besides being a like super flirt okay um but she said personal when aroused and meaning aroused like um, i was like i was gonna say i feel like i need to like quickly be like she doesn't mean sexually (laughs) aroused she (laughs) She doesn't mean they were when aroused when he would get like worked up borrowed herman's mustache wax (laughs) without asking for it without asking permission and this led Herman to literally beat the shit out of him. Oh, no. A huge physical altercation arose between them. Like, they bought the two of them. Shit. And, quote, the Gilmanton boy literally cleaned up the room with his companion. That's how it was described. Oh, my God. And left, and I mean this is my favorite because of what it is over. Because it's ridiculous. Like, and left him with black eyes and a scratched face. Over a little bit of mustache wax. But the fact that it was over wax. mustache wax is so Victorian, I can't. The only thing I can think of is that, like, it would have been probably pretty expensive back then. And I also think he was just, like, a wild man. Yeah. Who was just ready to hurt someone at a moment's notice. I think you call that issues. <laughs> issues, I think issues. so. Give him a tea. Now, during this time, um, Herman was very focused on getting through med school as quickly as possible. He wanted to start making that... Bank. And that's like not, I not think the way how you want to do it. Med school, <laughs> no. Not like quick. And this was seemingly at the cost of literally everything in his life. Uh, well, most people knew he was married to a woman in New Hampshire. He never really spoke about Clara to anyone. She never visited him. Instead, he just spent his time studying or he would kind of just pursue subjects that he didn't think were covered well enough in school. Which you would think would make him smarter, but it didn't. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Brew, but it didn't. it didn't. Mrs. Brew said, "Quote: He always pictured himself as at the top notch of his profession. I rather thought he had a very high idea of his ability. That he was self conceited. Oh, those are like the worst kind the of people worst. to be around too. Like you're just like, oh, the worst. Like like a know it all is yeah. not my fave. A know it all is the worst kind of person ever. <laughs> they really are." <laughs> We fucking hate no one all. I hate them all. They're the worst. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, that's not what I was saying. (laughs) I had to say, oh, I hit my funny pose. I love it. It's not funny. It's not humorous. Look in the mirror. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I have, you know, you have to laugh at yourself. Uh, But of, (laughs) of all the subjects that he covered in med school, he was really into chemistry. Oh, which is why? a very grim foreshadowing of his future activities in Chicago, by the way, which we will get to. Oh, hate that. Can um, I just say? Yeah. I fucking hated chemistry in high school. I like chemistry, but it was one of the hardest subjects to me. I it's never got, difficult. I never understood chemistry. It's ever. very interesting to me, but it is fucking hard. Like yeah. that was one of the subjects I struggled with. The it most. is interesting. Biology, I got you. But oh, like, biology, I loved It's hard. And organic chemistry, I think that's what I had to take actually in high school. And I literally almost took organic chemistry in high school. Okay, maybe not. (laughs) I was like, what the fuck? Probably not. (laughs) Um, I was like, probably probably not. not. (laughs) Organic chemistry just sucks. I don't know. Whatever we took, I didn't understand. But what's worse than chemistry is the other fucking one that you have to take. Maybe it starts with a P. Physics? Yeah, fuck physics. <laughs> fuck physics. Oh my god. And I had this. I mean, like, don't fuck physics like in reality because like we need it. No, but, we need so much physics. But like, I don't want to learn. Inertia, about it. who knows her? I don't know her. <laughs> who knows? Her? Inertia. I hardly know her. Ah! Inertia. I hardly know her. <laughs> there, there, you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> don't worry. I fixed it. Okay. Huh. <laughs> so loved chemistry. 
Not a great foreshadowing in his future. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Bruce said he was just always fucking around with liquids and concoctions in his room at the Don't boarding love house. That. With like and with what little free time he had, he actually got a tutor to help him in chemistry because he was so focused on it. Okay. Dr. J. O. Lindsley, who was a physician and expert in chemistry. And he did this because he thought the chem department just did a shit job. He was like, you're not doing enough. Okay. <laughs> That's just like who he was. It's like, also like, you, you don't suck. know what you're doing yet. So yeah. how do you know that they're like, not you doing don't really enough? Know. But he quickly turned his room at the boarding house into like a laboratory, essentially. Um, tons of bottles and all kinds of test tubes and fluids and unlabeled shit. And like just it was starting to get wily up in there. And it scared the shit out of Mrs. Brew. Like, it would scare me, too. He was like, she was like, it was starting to get a little too much for me. I think I'm, like, fucked in the head with, like, things that I, like, relate other things <laughs> Why? to. Why? What are you relating All I can to? think of right now is Jack in The Nightmare Before Christmas trying to figure out the meaning yes. of Hall- or of Christmas. That's and not And then fucked. Sally is Mrs. Brew. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but my brain like, just Like, he's just sitting that. there, like, fucking around with Tinkturing. liquids in his room. Yeah. Yeah, right? He's, like, you know, dissolving. Herman's like, what's ornaments this? Ornaments and this? shit. <laughs> like, that's what <laughs> Oh, magic in the air. <laughs> I hope not. Oh no, he said but there's murder in the there's air. There's murder in the air because he's fucking terrible. Uh, he is not Jack Skellington. I still love Jack Skellington. <laughs> it's wild the amount of people that are in the same boat as you. Yeah. And it was honestly, it was a foreshadowing to who I would marry because I I love me a tall, a tall skeleton of a man. <laughs> that's that's what I love. I love that. <laughs> With a great voice. Oh my gosh. So there you go. Because I loved Jack's voice. And everybody on planet Earth <laughs> loves John's voice. <laughs> I mean, I can't blame you. He, has a good uh, voice. he does. He has a great one. Now, according to Mrs. Bruce, quote, Herman was fairly wild over chemistry. <laughs> wild and out. <laughs> he was wild. Wild. I love wild. that she use that word too like he was fairly wild (laughs) she was like that dude was feral up there he was going off (laughs) but she said and he was all the time experimenting with liquids in his room and while she kind of looked at it as he was just very committed to med school it's probably more likely that he just wanted to get as much experience with chemistry because he wanted to patent that medicine to become fucking rich Right, right right away he knew that was the subject he that's why he got the tutor that's everything it wasn't oh they're not doing enough at school and i'm just really committed to my education it's like no i need to make a medicine right so i can get a million zillion dollars fast track now he was always telling everyone at the boarding house that he knew what he was doing with the chemicals everyone needs to chill but i don't blame everybody for being scared shitless i'd be scared that it was just gonna explode i'm also surprised that he was allowed to have the amount of chemicals he had I know they just kind of let it happen, but right, Mrs. Brew also said that when he left, finally, that they found about three pounds of shingle nails hidden away in his closet. I'm sorry, Hua. And they never understood what he had them for. That to this day for the better. Probably we probably don't want to know why. What he are had shingle those. nails? Like big nails. Like I think like roofing nails. Like the fuck. Oh, like really heavy nails. duty nails. But. Again, very determined to get this done as fast as possible. And he was kind of overextending himself in all directions to get this done. He was constantly taking on extra work. But then one day, this took a very dark turn. Right, right. Because again, he's doing all this extracurricular work on top of all his work. So the darkest, one might say, was when Mrs. Brew did her daily house cleaning. And one of these times, she was sweeping upstairs and noticed a strong odor coming from Herman's bedroom. So she starts investigating the smell and she's coming over to his bed and she's like, why does it smell over here? What the fuck is this? So she sweeps her broom under the bed and something comes flying out. And she was fucking horrified to discover that when she swept out the object under the bed that was creating the stench, it was, quote, the body of a baby, <gasps> less than a year old, oh my God. stretched out on a board. Oh my God. I was not expecting that. None of us were. A, a real baby. A human baby. Oh less than a year old. Who had obviously died, was obviously being used for dissection, and he took it home. But you can't be doing that. You can't that. just take it home. Because it was no. on a board, so it was obviously being a medical studied specimen, quote unquote. Sure. To be dissected, but he took it home to no, use no, it. No, 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 no. That's not at all normal in any stretch of any imagination. Or legal. 
Nope, not at all. She fucking lost it, obviously. Immediately confronted Fred Ingalls, because that was his roommate. Oh, yep. And she was like, where the fuck did this come from? And Fred was like, uh, so he said... He had quote, um, he had, he, or he, excuse me, Fred confronted Herman. Yeah. Because he was like, I don't know what that is. So like, that's holy shit. not mine. And her, he said that Herman told him that he had, quote, brought the body in during the night and had started to dissect it. And he had no idea how or where he had acquired this body. But he said, quote, the sight was so repulsive to him that he could not go to sleep, realizing that that body had been in his room for how long? No fucking way. Mrs. Bruce said she couldn't sleep for weeks. And even like 13 years later, when she talked about it, she was still like shuddering about it. Of course. I can't imagine. You have no idea what you're about to sweep under that, uh, from under that bed. And it's a baby. And he did it again another time. He brought home another baby at one point. I'm surprised she didn't kick him out right then and there. Well, that's the thing. He never said where he got this baby. But as soon as he got back that night, she was like, um okay hey. new house rule dissection of human remains cannot happen in my house like, like didn't think i'd have to say that didn't think i had to add that to the lease agreement but here we are wow yeah it's like when you see those stupid warnings on like things that are like hey don't eat this like very horrible liquid that will turn your stomach inside out yeah and it's like someone ate that oh 100 percent. for that to have to be a warning or like don't stand in this trash compactor and it's like that that was because someone did it and they had to put it down no it's true that's now that's in her lease agreement for future tenants and people are like someone did that and we you have to agree to it now i'm that little asshole that one time ate a glow stick damn yeah i had to go to the hospital i forgot about that yeah i was like very little yeah like it wasn't very recent yeah it was (laughs) it was like five years ago guys okay (laughs) it was like the other day no i'm just kidding it was a while ago but when the semester ended that summer, he told the, uh, Mrs. Brew that he would most likely not be returning to Burlington the following semester. And she was like, a bye. Yeah. And she was like, that's fine. And she actually said that he, quote, did not think that the university here offered enough advantages for such a brilliant and promising young man. That's what he thought. Woof. And that's basically what he told her. Get out of here. Yeah. And he was, also, he was also apparently disappointed with the limited number of chemistry courses offered very into chemistry i wonder wonder why why. and he felt that he could go to the university of michigan at ann arbor and that would be a better place to go with a better price i'm from michigan (laughs) i'm from michigan (laughs) so just a few months later he followed through with the plan and he enrolled at the university of medicine uh, medicine at the university of michigan (laughs) i was like the medicine and the michigan and the medicine Medicine uh so for now he's leaving new england in Bye, girl. View mirror. Goodbye. Don't come back. Oh, and throughout this entire thing, Clara has been supporting him financially. By the way, Clara, sweetie. and also raising their son, sweetie. No, like literally, his whole life is being supported by Clara Herman. I don't know her. Herman, fuck off. So Herman relocates to Ann Arbor in 1882, and uh, despite his mom and his sister not being happy about it, Clara and the baby went with him this time. How dare you live with your husband and father? Remember, they have a weird thing. You so, can't. His mom and sister, Helen, never liked Clara because of that weird jealousy thing, and they would frequently encourage him to end the relationship. Kind. Meanwhile, Clara's doing everything for him, but okay. According to Laura Young, who ran the general store after Herman left, she was um, Clara's cousin. Mm-hmm. Um, she said, quote, when Herman went to Ann Arbor to study, Mrs. Mudgett and Helen thought it was outrageous for Clara to go with him. His sister Helen made the statement long before Herman left that he was not going to live with her any longer and she must support herself. The sister used to say that Clara was not bright enough, not refined enough for Herman. Bet you guys regret that, huh? Yeah. Because your brother turned out to be one of the most disgusting con men and serial killers in history. Also outrageous <laughs> but it's like, yeah helen clara's not bright enough or refined enough for your fucking monster of a brother yeah clara take several seats you wanna or not walk clara, helen. that statement back helen and mama mudget like <laughs> like really that's a that's a whole wow. bunch of wild right there yeah that's one of those you wish you could take back now, that didn't age well no now clara began working as a dressmaker in ann arbor well, he focused on finishing his medical degree, um, but they did not have a good marriage. Um, even before the couple left for Michigan, Herman had said to Laura Young, Clara's cousin, 
quote, being married would likely prevent him from rising as far in the world as he would have let, he would have otherwise, and that he thought that he and Clara would not get on together very well. He is wildly narcissistic. Like, he's literally like, mm, it's her dead weight that's making me not rise up in the world. And it's like, no, I think you're just dumb. And also, I don't think you're good at this. You're only moving around on her dime, asshole. Yeah, literally, she's the only one doing anything and raising your child. I think she could actually launch you into success if you fucking gave her a second. So when they moved to <clears throat> Michigan, they lived in a boarding house. And the other boarders there said that they remembered Clara very fondly. She, they said she was, quote, a very pleasant woman and willing to make any sacrifice that she might help Holmes along in his course. So they saw her as very sweet, very kind, and that she would do fucking anything for him. Oh, Yeah. They also said the couple fought a lot and that Clara, quote, was sometimes seen around the rooming house with black eyes. Oh, my God. Ding, ding, ding. He officially crossed over into monster territory. What the fuck? Fuck. So not only is he just like a lazy asshole piece of shit, he's, a he's woman an beater. abusive piece of shit too. So we have violence. Fuck you, Herman. Now, Clara struggled to keep the family afloat by herself for nearly two years, and the relationship was just crumbling steadily. And finally, just months before Herman graduated from the University of Michigan, she decided Hell she had yeah. fucking enough abuse, and she packed up the few stuff that she had and took her son back to New Hampshire. I'm so happy that she was able yeah. to do that on her own volition. And later in letters, she claimed that in the decade that followed her going to New Hampshire, she, quote, had known very little of her husband. Wow. Um, they actually remained married until he was executed. Oh, shit. They never got divorced. That's right. He never divorced her, but married several more times. That's so crazy. Yeah. He was a piece of shit. Uh, upon returning to Gilmanton, Clara and Robert lived with um, actually Herman's parents for a little bit until she Oof. was. Yeah. How and, was that? I know. Until she was able to find work as a dressmaker and she relocated herself away. Um, and once she was away from, you know, the mudgets. I was going to say uh, that situation. Yeah, she focused only on Robert. She didn't think a fucking thought about what the fuck Herman was doing. She Good. didn't give a shit. Um, and actually Clara's cousin, Laura Young said, even after he deserted her, she never chased after him as many women would. I think, however, that if Clara had followed Herman after he left her, because that's the thing, he had left her to go away and kind of abandoned her while he was in school and took all her money. And she just didn't but stick around But it was her who wait. left at the end. Yeah. Like, she really got out of there. But she said, I think, however, that if Clara had followed Herman after he left her and went west, that we never would have heard of her again. I think that he would have killed her as soon as she commenced to be in his way, for she would have never countenanced his action. Absolutely, because he was escalating by mm -hmm. first he's like talking shit about her, then he starts hitting her. Yeah. And then he we as we all know escalates to murder yeah. to the nth degree. And he's of course. Cheating on her. He's just like a piece of shit. Yeah. I I have no doubt he would have killed her. Very lucky to be ridded of that piece of dead weight. So good for her. Clara lost like exactly. 100 pounds. There you go. While in Burlington, you're like, I don't know how uh -huh. much he weighs, but that, however but... much he weighs, that's how much she lost. <laughs> she lost a few stones. Exactly. While in Burlington, Herman was a rigidly devout student of chemistry, obviously, like we said. But in Michigan, he now shifted away from chemistry a little bit and back to anatomy. Mm. And he really liked dissecting bodies. I don't love that. Um, in fact, one of the, his fellow students, John Madden, said, quote, he seemed to take a good deal of pleasure in the uncanny things of the dissecting room. That's what I, I mean, when you look at it now, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's fucked up. But like, yeah, I don't know. Dissection is interesting. I can't really like say it's not. But the fact that he's a murderer makes that weird. I've never you know? dissected anything. No, it's, it's definitely interesting yeah. if you're doing it for the right purpose. Yeah, for like biology um, and shit. Yeah. But he also was quoted that um, John Madden fellow student was quoted as saying, Holmes talked a great deal about what he had done in the dissecting room with what appeared to me at the time unnecessary gusto and told me that the professor of anatomy at the time was to permit him to take the body of an infant home with him for dissection during the spring vacation, which was to begin the following day. I asked where he would find a place to carry on his work without offending his neighbors, and he replied with something to the effect that he would find a place. So see, it happened again, where he asked to take home an infant. Why is dissect. it an infant that he I don't wants? know, but it's weird. Do you think 
I feel weird saying this, but do you think it's like an infant is easy to carry home versus an actual body? I guess. Or, I mean, that makes absolute logical sense. Bodies. Like logistically, that does make sense. Yeah. But infants are also very hard to dissect. I, I would think. Like it's not an easy di- evisceration or dissection for their they're tiny you yeah. know like it's all tiny it's and it's upsetting yeah I, it's more upsetting hopefully. than any human dissection has an element of upset sadness to it but it's like a baby is a whole different level and i would think that you would want to to learn on a full grown body because yeah. you're gonna i would think learn more except but there's just certain thing i mean at least you would think he would try it out i don't know though it's just a strange thing a strange quirk yeah of him. um but all in all, he was said to be a pretty below average student, which really? is very interesting with all his extra work and everything. I don't know. Maybe it's that he like he wasn't staying focused on actual. I think that's in a, exactly and like taking the right steps like he was going to, to Z when he should have been at F. Exactly. I think it was he was concentrating on what he wanted out of it and not what he needed to get out of it. And a lot of times you need like the foundations mm-hmm. to build upon. And he's yeah. building with no foundation. Exactly. I don't think he was really focusing on the curriculum. I think he was just looking at what he wanted, which was chemistry so he could patent a medication. Yep. And he was looking at anatomy because I think he was starting to feel some type of way. Mm. And I think he was only focusing on the things that he wanted for different reasons and not for a medical degree to become a doctor to help people. Because does he um, ever become a doctor? He does. Oh, he does. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, he, we'll get become, there. he graduates. Okay. And he does like, he works as a doctor for a little bit. Oh, okay. I didn't um, know that. But he's really a fraudster. Yeah. <laughs> it always um one teacher even voted against him graduating so really? he graduated by the skin of his fucking teeth shit he was not good at medicine he was not he was not very adept at it and one student described him hilariously um as quote he was distinctly what might be termed dumb he was slow <laughs> to grasp ideas and not ready at all in reasoning <laughs> okay which is funny to hear considering he's an actual piece of shit. And so uh, it's yeah. like, you're dumb. Exactly. Um, well, I, and he like thinks he's so fucking oh, smart. Oh, he thinks he is the gift. Uh, this is uh, also hilarious and disgusting. But another said he was below mediocre. Um, another student also said that he smelled strange oh. and that he had a nickname. Uh-oh. Do you want to know what his nickname was? Of course I want to know. His nickname was Smegma. <laughs> <laughs> please look that up if you don't know what it is that's so gross just just google it and look at the first definition that comes up i want to look at the first definition that comes up anyway that's gonna give you an idea of what he smelled like apparently why did he smell like that (laughs) oh oh my god i can't even say that out loud that's why i didn't i'm just gonna encourage you all why him smell like foreskin why why though why why though oh ew you know when you say a smell and then you feel as though and this is what this gave me joy because it's like the great hh holmes the like infamous like criminal of the century was called smegma that's so by his peers in med school so this little bitch is nothing nothing but a a foreskin smelling below average student who couldn't even keep his first wife. That's really fucking gross. Yeah. So moving on from that, now without uh-huh. Clara supporting his stupid ass, uh, Herman was forced to find his own fucking job <laughs> and support himself while Ew. he finished the degree. I'm still really affected. So he now found his own job with William Herdman, who was an, anatom- an anatomy instructor with the university, and he worked as his assistant. He was responsible to, like, you know, menial things like tending to the horses, doing his errands, but he also prepared the bodies and assisted in di- the dissecting room. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, maybe he had plans to uh, murder and defraud on like a galactic scale later. <laughs> Perhaps. But, but I think it was more that this was kind of the training along with the whole chemistry obsession this is all the stuff that just kind of like slowly put the pieces together for him to become that later. Yeah. I don't know if he had all that in mind quite yet. I don't think he really had the foresight. Probably came over time. You know? <clears throat> um, but it was also at this time that he claims he and his classmates first came up with the idea of faking a death and then using a body 
as proof to defraud an insurance company, uh, which became his thing. That's not good. Um, also in 1884, Holmes was uh, in some serious trouble. Hmm? He had to defend himself before the medical faculty after being charged with breach of promise. Breach of promise? He got himself a breach notice, oh, which is not a fun notice to get because they're usually bullshit. Uh, usually. So, so he married. This one, I think, was real, though. So he married. He's married to Clara. He's okay. married to Clara, hasn't divorced her, hasn't <laughs> legally separated from her in any way. Fantastic. Married until he was executed. Remember that. Well, he's staying now at a boarding house, and the person who owns this house is a widow who also was a hairstylist hey! by the name Mrs. Fitch. She and him started a relationship. They started sleeping together. Girly, he smells like smegma. <laughs> I know. Ew. And he made the promise of marriage to her, probably to get her into bed. And to get her money. That's yeah. definitely what it was. To make her sleep with him, he was like, I will marry you. Of course. I'll um, make you an honest woman. Back in these days, that's fucking serious that's yeah. serious business you can't be married to someone else and promise marriage to another just to get them into bed that's not just like distasteful and bad that's like ooh. can't you like hang for that shit back then it's a, i mean i don't know if you can hang for it but you're not going to graduate medical school that's for sure it's adultery isn't it it's yeah yeah so mrs fitch found a letter he was writing to his actual wife clara at the time who he was still talking to and corresponding with and kind of like stringing along a bit. Aww. And she ran to the medical fact faculty and was like, look at this. Look at this. And then also showed them a proposal letter he had written to her, like written down the proposal, signed it with his name. Well, and she, shit. she said, this is breach of promise. He promised me marriage and he's married to another. And if found guilty, he would not be allowed to graduate medical school and everything he had done would be for fucking not. So how did this fucker dance his way around yep. that? So he denied it all. And his professor, Professor Herman, who he was assisting under, the anatomy e. Herman. assistant, he came to his defense and he vouched for him saying he thought he was truthful. He was like, he's an upstanding guy. I've never had a problem with him. I didn't, you know, I don't believe that this is real. Well, Holmes got off on the charges and poor Mrs. Fitch was left to look like a liar. So he graduates. He's able to graduate. On fucking graduation day, he shakes Professor Herman's hand. Or ex excuse me, Professor. Um, His name was not Professor Herman. Oh, uh, no, not Herdman. Herman. It was Herdman, excuse uh, me. So I was close. It's like you heard with Perd. You heard, man. Uh, but <laughs> you heard with Perd. <laughs> uh, but he shakes Professor Herdman's hand and says, Doctor, those things are true that that woman said about me. <gasps> So he allowed this man to vouch for him. Why and then on the day of graduation was like, ha ha, fucker. That's it. Like, that is such a dick move because he could have just, a dick move. like, shaking his hand is one thing when you're a when you lied to his fucking face. You're shaking his hand and being like, hey, asshole, you lied for me, technically. And didn't even realize it. Wow. That's fucked. And Herdman later said that this was the first moment that he realized that Holmes was, quote, a scoundrel. Yeah. And he later find out, found out that he was more of a scoundrel because after this, he dug a little deeper and found out that Herman... Holmes there had burglarized his home. Herdman's home? Yep. And while staying with him once in an extra bedroom, yep. he had pried open a locked drawer in his... Didn't see that. What was that guy's name? The tree guy? Oh, the tree guy. Oh, my God. Oof, that episode, man. Oof. Woo! Uh, was it Matthew Holmes? Holmes. Oh, my God! What the fuck? Was it what? Matthew Holmes? Was it Matthew Holmes? I'm looking it up right now. Correctly? I feel like potentially. Hold on, Matthew my, Holmes. My fucking thumbs can't even go fast enough. Well, if that's the same, that's an Australian actor. Hold on, shook so his hand. Nothing was just you like, can do. Thanks for letting me get this. Like, what a piece of shit. Wow. I'm trying to like think of anybody that I can even compare that to. Right. It's just so dirty. It it's is such a dirty pool. Down and dirty. Now Herman graduated from the University of Michigan in the late spring of 1884, and almost immediately. He relocated to more Mower's Forks. I'm yeah, girl, you did that. Not sure if I said that. You right. did. It's a tiny hamlet in upstate New York. Um, it had previously been um, part of a larger town of Champlain. Oh, okay. So once there, he opened a small tree nursery. Uh, yeah, he got weird with it, like Matthew Hoffman did. Oy. Yeah, he got a little weird with it. Not as weird as Matthew Hoffman did, I will say, because um, he just kind of abandoned it. A few yeah. months, it, it wasn't profitable, so he just abandoned it. Okay. But, like, what a weird little direction to take. Um, and he does that to everything in his life that doesn't serve him. 
how he wants it to. He just abandons it. Good. At one point, he hired a primary school teacher named Minnie Everett for French lessons. Um, Why? She terminated that relationship pretty quickly because she said, quote, and at the time she said this, there is something lurking in that man's character that time will reveal. Oh, I do not like him. I firmly believe that he would commit murder. Wow, Minnie. Like, you were just here to teach him French. What made you think he's going to revolt to murder? And for her to say that time will reveal, like, it hasn't happened yet, but something's something's in there. I love Mm -hmm. that she was a full-blown witch. Oh, a full-blown witch. You can't tell me anything else. No, Minnie Everett, she knew. Oh, there's been people that I've said that. Well, not the murder thing, but, like, that's, like, the best feeling when you're, like... I fucking knew you. I were had off. your number the second I saw you. Yep. You have done that a couple of times that that were like chef's kiss perfect. Oh my gosh, thank you. Like, and at first you're like, no, it's fine, and then later you're like, what the fuck? How did yeah. you know that? Yep. Sometimes but I just get a vibe. You just you didn't. I bet Minnie was an empath. She definitely was. Anyway, um, he also aggressively refused to leave her alone after this for some time. So he was a stalker as well. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, he's a little bitch. But after this failure. Holmes petitioned the local school trustees to hire him on, and he was put in charge of the primary school. Like, he was able to get a lot of... He's one of those that you're like, how were you able to get all these things? But it's... Oh, it's... He's a con man. Yeah. And he saved money doing this. He was able to save a lot of money, and he opened his own medical practice. That's terrifying. Uh, During this early period in New York, he kind of perpetrated a small but kind of big medical con. It was his first one. Um, so a smallpox scare broke out in this town Oof. and people were urging residents to get vaccinated against smallpox. And he saw this as an opportunity. So he somehow got his hands, probably by stealing, <laughs> on a load of vaccines and he loaded up a wagon and he went door to door through the northern part of the state vaccini- vaccinizing, vaccinating <laughs> residents and telling them that it was mandatory. Oh, And he was, quote, representing himself as an authorized official of the Board of Health. He made the people think that it was compulsory. And in every household, he managed to get several cases for which he charged 25 cents each. So at the time, no one questioned his authority or asked to see his credentials. They just allowed it. If this man is trying to poke you with a needle. Yeah, you've got to ask for an ID. Ask for his cred. (laughs) Ask for anything. Ask his name. (laughs) Ask for his library card. Literally anything. Christ on a cracker, everybody. He made a lot of money doing it, though. But And obviously, people must have been terrified, so they probably were like, just vaccinate me. But that's what what he fed on. He prayed on it. He loved praying on that kind of shit. Wow. So that was his first medical con. Can you imagine if, if that shit still happen today like knock 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 hi i'm I'm here to vaccinate you and no i don't have any id (laughs) don't ask me about it please leave like no i'd love your credentials thank you but back in his medical office he started setting up a laboratory because he was really trying to get that patented medicine he was gonna get rich from it and to help him with this he was said to have brought in to stay with him for a while, his six-year-old son, Robert. No, 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 no. And he, quote, and put him to work in the laboratory, putting up in putting up in bottles the liquid which Herman manufactured. Although he never sold any of these things that he made, like he just couldn't get the right concoction together. Sure. He definitely tried, um, but he also couldn't convince anybody to try any of his cures because people didn't trust him. I mean, so they were like... Minnie came to teach him French and she was like, you're a murderer. Yeah, like, you're a murderer. (laughs) Minnie knows. But what's weird about him is he's somewhat of an anomaly in the sense that he was a get rich quick guy and he was a con man, but he also didn't shy away from hard work. Mm. Like he would work for his cons. Well, because he was like money motivated. Yeah, like he's very strange in that way. Like he doesn't have that like, like cut and dry, get rich quick personality right it's it's strange but it should be said that while he claimed the boy in his company was his son there is a lot of speculation that this was a completely unrelated boy who disappeared a little while after this oh no according to the new york's new york times there was a report filed shortly after he was arrested like way later um and it said that after he left his teaching position in new york that he had quote Went home, went to Massachusetts, hey yo, <laughs> but returned no. in a short time, accompanied by a small boy who disappeared shortly after his arrival. Holmes saying he had gone home. It doesn't appear that any investigation 
went into this boy's identity or disappearance and nobody really went further into it. But if this boy has what like was part of something nefarious, then he was his first victim. Holy shit. Do you, and they were what never able to confirm whether that was Robert or not. And you would think it would be as easy as like somebody reaching out to Clara. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, I think this might've been a boy that he took. Wow. And used until he didn't need any more. I hope not. I hope it was Robert and then he just went to Massachusetts I to take so him home. I hope so too. Like that's honestly, I'm hoping that, but yeah. I don't know. I can't be sure because he's such a piece of shit. Right. It was also in New York that there were rumors about his um, inappropriate behavior with women. Ugh. Um, and inappropriate, like he was a pig. And on several occasions, he was known to have treated out of town women for what's only referred to as organic trouble in his office. What is organic trouble? Not sure. <laughs> and there were rumors that they were all like that these women were treated and then disappeared because they were from a house of ill repute. Oh. You know, so they were treated as less dead. Yeah. But there was never any confirmation of this, no identities that we can like hang our hats on but that probably happened it probably happened and there were reports of herman paying quote violent attention to a young woman named alan what who eventually left town and was never heard from again oh hopefully she actually did leave town yeah and actually there were rumors around this new york town that holmes had actually married her but they said that it, like there was rumors that he had married her, but then there was rumors that she left town. But the ones that everybody kind of sits on is that she probably met a sinister end at his hand. It kind of sounds that and way. And they just couldn't prove it. And especially. But she was never found again. Yeah. Like, that's definitely he did something. Especially if he had already killed that boy. Yeah. Something happened here. Right. There's That's what I mean when I say there's definitely more over the ones he confessed to and are confirmed. Right. And I think a lot of people think that. Now, despite honestly referring to him as a hard worker and a generally, like, fine man, aside from his, like, preoccupation with, like, out-of-town women and being a little weird, um, residents found something just off-putting about him. Right. Like, people around him were, like, he was never, like, mean outwardly to people. He, He didn't do, like, you know, he was a little weird, but, like, not, like, super strange or eccentric, like... There was just something about it. It's like Minnie said. There was just right. something that was going to be revealed. Can't put we your finger on it. just didn't know what was. And women in the village began st- sharing stories of his, you know, unwanted advances. And the men began noticing a growing trend of homes ignoring debts and making false promises to pay for things. And But he always had an excuse. Of course. He always had an excuse. So he was, uh, women, he was getting the reputation of being a pig. Men, he's getting the reputation of being a fucking deadbeat. Mm. So on one occasion, his landlord confronted him and was like, hey, you haven't paid your rent. And I've tried to get you to pay your rent for like fucking months. Oh, shit. And he said it was, and he had come forward to him when he knew he had plenty of money. He was like, the doc, he's a doctor. Like, I know he has money. And he said, quote, the doctor would stand quietly by and hear himself called a scoundrel and a swindler in the strongest terms. Then the tears would appear in the doctor's eyes and trickle down his cheeks, but he never said a word in reply. So he would just sit there and let people be like, you're a fucking scoundrel. You're a, a swindler. You're a piece of shit. Like, you're just, like, you're a deadbeat, blah, 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 And he would just sit there and cry and never say anything. That's very strange. Right? And also, like, sad, but, yeah. like, I don't want to feel sad. No, he's, no, because I think it's fake. It's fake as fuck. Those yeah. tears are crocodile tears, my friend. He would cry because he knew it was going to disarm anybody around him to see this mustachioed gentleman weeping openly after being called a scoundrel after refusing to pay for things he should have fucking paid for well and i think he's especially a physician yeah they were probably like what is happening right now and back then they're like a man crying what so strange i definitely did it just to disarm everybody and probably he was just unhinged i feel yeah he was fucking monster but he took similar approaches with his medical office landlord because he always had an excuse for not paying And then he would make empty promises to pay and then he would just cry when he was confronted or he would go into a rage sometimes when he was confronted and they would just be like, forget it. Well, I was going to say that some people cry when they're mad. Yeah. And it could be that he was just trying to like keep it together, but he was crying. Right. Um, 
And at one point, he produced a letter that supposedly was sent from someone in Gilmanton, where he was from, claiming his uncle had died and left him a substantial inheritance, which he said, oh, see, you just, I, I'll be able to pay you. Yeah, you just have Don't to worry. open the email attachment. Yeah, just look at this. Yeah, open that email attachment. It's definitely not a scam. Your royal uncle has passed away. Exactly. So... Herman's reputation in this New York village continued to decline towards the end of his residency in the village. And not long before leaving, he was involved in a scheme that was to avoid paying his debts that definitely will give you a little bit of a foreshadow into his later crimes. Oy. According to the Daily Boston Globe, there was an older soldier, a veteran living in town, who had for several months been dealing with like an unknown illness it was like a shuddering cough a lot of pain and the doctors kept trying to tell him it was malaria mm. but this soldier said no that's not it he refused to believe this diagnosis and he believed that it was being caused by an injury he had received during the war he said he'd gotten shot there was a bullet lodged in his lungs in his like the area of his ribs and he said it's pressing his ribs against my lungs and it's making it hard for me to breathe. I know that's what it is. Oh. But ultimately he was dying. So it really didn't matter to him personally what was going on, but if the injury was the result of him serving in the war in the military, his widow when he passed away was going to be granted his full pension. So he wanted to make sure, which I'm like, oh. I'm like, dun, I'm like this dun, man, dun. I know. And this poor man is like, I want my wife and my family to get all of that money. Yeah. So I need to make sure that I'm diagnosed before I die correctly. Like he oh. was doing this only for them. I'm like, what a good man. Also, what a fucking like, I know future to face. So for that reason, he asked um, Herman's landlord, Edward Steele, to be present for his autopsy, which I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, Imagine wow. having to ask that. No. But the, but Edward Steele couldn't come to the autopsy. So it was conducted without him there. And again, his cause of death was labeled as malaria. So Edward Steele felt horrible and he was desperate to make sure this widow got the full pension. So he asked Herman to do a second autopsy with him to help him. Uh -oh. And he was like, of course I will. I love dissection. So when he, so Steele's like, okay, you finish it. You tell me what you think. I want to see what you have to say about this. So he asks him for the results at the end of it. And Herman looks at him and says, yeah, I have evidence, but only, I'll only give it to you. So he's already extorting him. Yep. If that my rent is paid in full. We like, I'll only do my job if you yes. pay my rent. Like, You're dude. asking me to help out of the goodness of my heart. Which I don't this have. This widow to make sure he had this man's dying wish. You're, I have evidence that could help this, but well, I will only give it to you if you say that my rent is paid in full. What a fucking jackass. And he said, if you don't do that, I'm going to keep the evidence of the autopsy. And the widow won't get the full pension. And I don't give a shit. Oh, my God. And the evidence he had, he had the actual ribs. He had evidence that they were pressing against that the man's man was lungs. Correct. He was correct. Wow. He kept those broken ribs because Edward Steele looked at him and was like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, you I'll asshole. I'll figure out another way to get her her pension. And you know what? He did. Thank you. He got that widow his pension. And Holmes, Herman there, Herman fucking Mudgett. He kept those two broken ribs. What a fucking... No one knows what he did with them, but he kept those fucking ribs. What he a never gave them over. What a crazy person. Like, what? That's so weird. Like, what? Yeah. So shortly after he had done this, you know, extorted false evidence <clears throat> for payment of his rent. Yeah. He tried to leave this village without saying anything to anyone or paying any of his debts. He was just going to leave all of it behind. And... Although his landlord literally found him loading the wagon and being like, hi, <laughs> you still owe me all this hey money. There. He couldn't really stop him. Like he just the last anyone heard from him from this village was a letter sent from Tilton, New Hampshire, saying he had business to attend in New Hampshire and he would be in touch to settle his debts at a future date. Doubt it. Ding, ding, ding. He never did. Wow. Now, after leaving, Holmes returned to New Hampshire briefly and just tried to take full custody of Robert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Just 
Why not? No. You know, I haven't been part of his life for six years, but why not? No. Uh, and again, Claire and he were technically still married, so he never actually lost custody of him. He just, right. He just abandoned them. Um, <clears throat> it's unclear what actually happened here, but Clara ended up taking their son to her father's house and he left the state. So, like, she was like, mm, no, <laughs> like, good try. She's like, you're so a murderous piece happen. of shit. No, you can't yeah. have our son. But he definitely tried to. And without a job now or any source of income, he said, um, quote, starvation was staring me in the face. Doubt it. And he sold his horses in Tilton and he boarded a train for Pennsylvania. And when he left New Hampshire for the last time, he wanted to leave behind everything, meaning he wanted to leave behind Herman Webster Mudgett. Oh. He was now going to be known formally as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. H. H. Holmes. Do you have any idea how he came up with that name? I do not. He just wanted H. 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 Yeah. Sounds like H. H. Holmes is a, I don't know how, I mean, I think he just made it, he thought it sounded good. Mm. There's all kinds of speculation that he used uh, Sherlock Holmes as his uh, inspiration, but that wasn't published until a year after. So. Oh, so incorrect. So it wasn't it. You um, pressed an incorrect key. So I think it was just, there was a name he came up with, I guess. It was okay. Unfortunately, a good one. Uh, so he, <clears throat> Holmes now arrived in Norristown, Pennsylvania, which is a town just outside of Philadelphia, in the fall of 1885. And he found the city well, wasn't as bumping as he thought it was going to be. Uh, a lot fewer opportunities than he was expecting. You're such an and, elder. <laughs> well, <laughs> this place is bumping. <laughs> wow, guys. This place is so bumping. <laughs> I could not let know, that man. go. A city could bump, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was great. A lot isn't really known about this time period. Um, there is some evidence that suggests that just days after having arrived, he walked into the police precinct and told officers there that he was, quote, on the verge of starvation and had come here with the express intentions of committing suicide. That's a quote, by oh. the way. Um, I don't know if that actually happened. That is a report. Hmm. Police officers did say that happened. So who knows Probably what did. that was about? Um, they took pity on him and they let him stay in the station while they tried to find him some work. And they ended up finding him work in the Norristown State Hospital, which was a state funded psychiatric hospital a few miles from Philadelphia. Sad that um, that would never happen today. Well, that's here's the thing. As he either because it's not clear if that particular part happened. Yeah. There's some stories like that. that I don't know if that was later concocted by him to um, gain some sympathy. Right. But he did get a job working at this hospital. You just don't know how. Yeah. This is the story he tells. Uh, like I wouldn't believe shit that comes out of his yeah, face. Yeah. I don't so. know if I buy that. Like they, they, that's they just how took he such, tells it. such pity on yeah. you, you poor lad. But no matter what, he did get work at the Norristown State Hospital. Um, and years later in his autobiography, Holmes said that it was a very troubling experience for him. He said, quote, so terrible was it that for years afterwards, even now, sometimes I see their faces in my sleep. Good. The patients at the psychiatric hospital. I'm glad he was haunted. Now, after just a few months in Norristown, he actually abandoned that job at the state hospital because that's what he does and found a new position at a pharmacy in Philadelphia, which is much more his speed. Um, as would become his M.O., this job also didn't last long, and there was some mysterious shit that happened before he left it. Right, bro. He abandoned the job and Philadelphia completely after a local boy died after taking some medicine purchased from Holmes at the ha pharmacy. Oh. He claimed he had nothing to do with the medicine, nothing to do with the boy's death, but it definitely put a black mark on his already questionable reputation, and they're really... Wasn't a future hint for him in Philadelphia after this because people were like, no, thank you. Yeah, like we're all set. Yeah, I'm doing an X sign with my fingers just so you know. Everyone went, no, thank you. X Get away sign. from us. So this is when the idea of faking a death and using a substitute dead body to defraud insurance came back around. They had talked about it a little in college. It's coming back. And Holmes now is ready to do it. Okay. Because now he's like, I've tried this working thing for a minute or two too hard and it's hard so let's just scam insurance money please now money <laughs> so according to him he apparently contacted an old college friend which imagine how hard that was back in the day 
yeah you had to really want to contact someone i think that all the time when i'm driving and i have my gps on i'm like yeah. how the fuck would i ever get anywhere yeah i wouldn't know where anything like was. how do people do that how do, how do you do it maps <laughs> but i even, suppose they didn't uh, there was a point then, in time where they didn't have that I'm shit. saying either way he was also his friend was in dire straits financially as well and they decided that they would get one more friend involved and this other friend was going to be the one to increase his life insurance to forty thousand dollars at the time and he would do this by telling the insurance company that he dealt with some kind of life altering experience that made him concerned for his family's well-being. So he wanted to up the amount. I feel like you might need to get a little more specific than that. I guess back then insurance was just like, sure thing, buddy. Yeah. Now, he would then later, this man, the plan was to send his wife and child somewhere out west near California. And he was going to fake confess via letter that he had killed them both in some kind of alcohol induced frenzy. And add that he had dismembered and pickled their bodies. Christ. I figured that was to make sure he didn't have to show bodies to insurance, but like, that's not the case, which is weird. And then he was going to have claimed to have killed himself in the note, this friend. Okay. Then the money would go to a quote unquote relative of this man, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, his Mm -hmm. friends. And he would move out to where his very much alive wife and kid were, live with some of the money that was shelled out to him. It was going to be between the three of them you know live in obscurity that's something i've never thought of like if you murder your family and you're a murderer who gets your life insurance payout like will like do you get a payout if you've murdered somebody no i don't think you get it if you were like but no but like the person so like if you have murdered and then yeah killed yourself whoever is in your policy gets that exactly money. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> that's a weird <laughs> like, thought well, damn huh? i know it is weird right and that's what the, that's what they banked on was mm. like they could control who he wrote down in his policy. Right. Now, me thinking the dismemberment detail was to make sure he didn't have to show bodies. Apparently, that wasn't right. They had to show bodies regardless. regardless three bodies, which meant they were going to have to procure three imposter dead bodies, including a child. And put them in a pickle jar. Yeah. And like I was like, you would have to dismember them. Yeah. That's a lot. So he went to Minneapolis. So uh, at this time, so this is what they wanted to do. Plan the whole thing out. So Holmes had went to Minneapolis and Chicago during this time. I don't know why I said Minneapolis. Minneapolis you know is what? what I meant. I was going to let it go. And then I was thinking the world. Won't, you know, so I was I'm glad you corrected. Thank you. Yourself. Because that's I rolled over and I said, oh, that's not a big deal. And then I said, yep, that's a big deal. <laughs> and I went back. <laughs> Minneapolis is what I meant. And Chicago during this time. And he was able to get a job as a drug clerk in a pharmacy. And okay. according to him, he was able to procure bodies pretty easily by buying them from med school anatomy rooms at the time because now he had money. Mr. Burke, Mr. Hare. Exactly. Now, also, that was just very easy to do back then. So as we well know, he got two bodies. Okay. He was able to buy two bodies, probably adult ones, I assume, and put them into barrels, which he stored in a room at the McCoy Hotel in Chicago. Damn. But apparently after hearing or reading about how well insurance companies checked into cases like this and would like require a lot of uh, evidence and proof. Right. He decided they should abandon the whole idea. Now, he had two bodies now. Yeah. So this is when he says, oh, OK, well, that's I just said like, oh, no. And I just buried those bodies in my basement. Mm-hmm. Like not a big deal. This story, people believe, was possibly concocted and changed a bit to help him explain why there were a lot of bones found buried in his Chicago place. Oh, good. He, they were probably the result of something even more sinister, just what we don't know, but he wanted to make it look like, well, I purchased bodies legally, and I just buried them down there because we decided not to go ahead with the scheme. Like, don't fucking put those on me, buddy. And it's like, <laughs> I no, I think you killed those people. It's like, there's a lot to unpack here. That's the thing. Like, he'll, he comes out with things and it's like, ah, legal. Right. I did it legally. And it's like, no, I think you killed them. And I think you're so good at lying. That's the only thing you are good at is you're making this story up so that we don't question those bones in the basement. But in reality, if they had questioned those bones in the basement, which they didn't in time to identify them or figure something out, we probably would have figured out that those were missing people, probably. Hundo P. Guarantee you. Damn. So he leaves Philadelphia in the spring of 1886 after definitely murdering people and he eventually settled in inglewood a suburban neighborhood on the south side of chicago and this is where shit really starts to get wild and it's where you're gonna and it's where we're gonna end part one i'm waiting for part two you because the chicago chronicles are really where 
it's a it's whole a, new era. Is, are the Chicago Chronicles bumping? They are. Uh, they're bumping in some way, <laughs> not in a good way. Is that what I you suppose. Said you said bumping. Right? I said bumping. Yeah. I sure did. That Bump was something it. I you said. You know, bumpets are coming back. That's upsetting. Yeah, that's how we'll uh, end this episode. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's an upsetting end so to bye. this episode. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned for part two. And um, he gets worse and worse. So fantastic. Yeah. Happy anniversary to us. Yay. Five years. Woohoo. Thanks, guys. We love you. And we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. But that's weird that this entire time, every single time Elena has said something about him writing his own autobiography, all you can think of is Ashley Simpson singing autobiography while Henry Holmes, or is that his name? Henry? Yeah. yeah. And while he writes his autobiography and he's like, my autobiography. <laughs> that's all I've been thinking. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> my autobiography. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>